Um, thank you, guys. Um, thank you, Emily, for the introduction. So, mm. all right, that's you guys can hear me, right? Um, okay, so this is a games on a budget. It's a way of thinking of this is kind of how we think about thinking about games for change for change. I really wanted to call this talk games for change for change, but I was told that was confusing, which it probably would be. Um, so uh, I'm Greg Trefry. I'm a uh, I run Gigantic Mechanic uh, with my partner, Mati Romeo, and I'm one of the founders of the Come Out and Play Festival. So I keep, I, last year, after all the talk about VR and this year and neuroscience, I was like, man, that's amazing, and those, that stuff is so effing expensive. Um, like, you all thought web games were expensive? Like, wait till you get the budget for uh, a fully rendered, th like, 3D VR space, you know? Um, and there are tools out there which are going to make that cheaper, but it's still really expensive. And so. Um, the space that we operate in with uh, Come Out and Play and a lot of uh, stuff we do at Gigantic Mechanic is much more on that sort of lower end of things. Like we're really kind of down on the scrappy community level. Um, and so I kind of wanted to, you know, I, this is like a place to kind of think about some of these issues and I wanted to do that um, with everyone here. So first off, um, this is going to be, it's a, this is a, supposed to be a workshop. This is a really weird format for a workshop to talk at you all like this. So I am going to try and make this as interactive as possible. So first off, I wanted you guys to, uh, this is like a big thing that I'm, I'm a, really important to me, this idea of uh, collaboration and community. So I want to take a second, I want you all to um, introduce yourselves to the people around you. And if you know the people sitting next to you, introduce yourself to somebody else. Um, and specifically what I want you to do is I want you to um, take about a minute and say who you work with, um, and what you're doing, and, uh, and then also what you're excited about. So I'll go first and give you my example. So I, as I said, we run Come Out and Play, which is a big street games festival. And one of the things that really excites me, the thing that really I get really animated about, is this idea of uh, the way that play creates communities and the way that play interacts with communities. So I want you guys all to take a moment to do that with the people sitting next to you. This is your chance to meet more people. Um, I know you guys have been doing that all, all last couple days, but do it now. So take about a, um, a minute, talk to the people next to you, and uh, introduce yourselves, who you are and what you're excited about. <laughs> Cut the conversation short, but we're gonna keep moving. All right, guys. All right. So there'll be more chance to talk later. Everyone, can I? I've started up a motor, which won't stop. Um, awesome. So I'm super excited you guys are all excited to talk to each other. That's awesome, because that's where a lot of this is going to happen. So um, we'll, you guys will have a chance to talk again later. So uh, four things to bear in mind real quick. Um, and so a lot of this stuff I'm going to say in this talk is not like rocket science, right? Um, you've heard it in different format, like forms. Uh, Aaron's talk beforehand about Glass Lab. A lot of the same ideas are here. Um, and so I'm just going to say them in really su stupid, simple ways, um, and then hopefully just ram home certain points. So four things to bear in mind before you get started thinking about games. Um, so some of you may be funders, some of you may be developers, some of you may be uh, thinking, people thinking about just how do I make a, get some game out there in the world. So first off, games are super expensive. Um, even ones where people are like, some guy made this and is like, uh, you, Colleen, you were talking about that game that somebody made for four years. 
Um, so if you averaged out the salary of someone for four years, that's a super expensive gain. Um, and uh, even though you may do it in your bedroom. So um, even a simple web game or what looks like a relatively simple web game is easily gonna run you 150 grand, right? Like, so this is a game we did Migrant Trail a number of years ago. Um, it's, uh, this was around what the budget was for that game. Um, and so that may seem large to you or it may seem small, it seems large to me, I don't have that much money. Um, uh, so uh, it, what I'm, my point is just that anything that like uh, is out there that you've heard of that looks complicated and interesting is expensive. So Filament has a great article on their blog about how they talk about pricing games and they get to the end, they're pretty cagey about um, the pricing and the, at the end they put in this figure, um, which you know that in some ways seems awful cheap. Um, so games are expensive, they're gonna cost you a lot to make. So that, and especially if you're thinking about video games, if you kind of get locked into like lots of technology and stuff. So that's one thing to bear in mind. Um, there is a ridiculous amount of competition for attention out there, right? From your desktop, if you just go on Steam, or everyone's like excited like with that slide earlier in the VC presentation about like, look at all the games out there. You can put it out there and be in front of a billion users. Um, but there's like also like a billion games and getting through all that noise. <laughs> is really hard so like you and there's like so many places to go and get games there's also you know you play on your pc on your laptop or your tablet there's all this weird shit to do in the world now too like so you're not just competing with games you're competing with kids that like want to go bouldering and go bowling and all this other stuff so don't forget that right like you know if you're like if you're thinking about entertaining people you have a lot of other stuff that you're competing with um Games don't generate audiences. So like, I, like whenever I hear people say like, oh, we're gonna make this game because the kids like the games these days. It's like, yeah, sure they do. Um, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna show up and play your game, right? So almost all successful commercial games are paying, they, they have to, you have to acquire users and it costs money to acquire users. And if you're have, operating on a budget, you probably don't have that money to do that. Um, you're probably just barely making the game and then, like, and then you gotta figure out like, now we've made it, now how do we get people to play it? So. Um, one of the things that we do is we start thinking about niche, um, niches and how we can directly engage and talk to those people. And this is gonna be something I'm gonna come back to again and again, um, is like narrowing your audience down. And this is just good practice in general, but it's extremely important if you're working with a limited budget. How do you figure out who the niche is that you're gonna talk to and talk straight to them? Because um, then you can say, you know, then the marketing dollars don't go to Facebook and Google AdWords necessarily, they go to you um, and the time you're gonna split in to um, actually talk to those folks. Um, so there are also lots of different types of games, right? So it's very easy to think like, oh, we should make a video game because video games are super sexy and there's lots of them mentioned at this conference a lot. Um, uh, but there's also tons of other games out there and, and you see it in like lots of the talks, like Colleen's talk again earlier, like she had great examples of card games and physical games. So there's um, lots of ways to think about games and they all have different strengths. So video games can communicate certain things and, um, and are very good. But card games communicate other, uh, they have a certain other qualities to them. They're easy to distribute in certain ways. They don't, you can't put them on the App Store, but people can um, get them. You can put them on Kickstarter. You can uh, let people download them. So you can access people in different ways. You can talk to different niches. Board games also have certain qualities. And like obviously there's been, there's a long history of uh, games for change being made in board game format. Um, physical games, basketball, and Nick Fortuna made an argument a couple years ago that this was the basketball was the greatest games for change ever made. Um, and that like uh, the, this point about like, yeah, this basketball probably keeps people in school. It keeps, uh, it keeps people physically active. It was designed with a specific intent. Um, so thinking about like uh, how you could design a game like that, it's just a different cost problem than a, than a video game. Um, and role playing games, there's a really amazing stuff that you can do with that. Like you can immerse people in different ways. You can, uh, if you're trying to communicate lots of content, like it's not easy to communicate lots of content with a sport. Um, so if you're looking to communicate content, maybe things like uh, role playing games or board games are the way to go. So I heard, highly encourage you guys to sort of break out of the mindset of like, we must make a video game. Video games are like, that's the easiest path to distribution because it's digital and I can get, every, get it in everyone's hands. I think that's sort of a myth, right? Like you may have a better chance getting a board game or a card game in more people's hands, um, despite it not being, able, you know, not being able to put it on the app store. Um, so the, those are sort of like things that, that we keep in mind as we're thinking about any new project that comes up. And so now I wanna jump into what I see are like eight questions to think about to help you frame your project, right? And so this talk is not about like all the tools you can use to make a game for cheap. You can go on the internet and find those. Um, there's plenty of uh, game making tools out there. This is more about like a conceptual way to think about what you're doing. Um, so 
first off, uh, this is like a super painful question for a lot of people, but it's what's your, you know, think about what your budget is. Uh, and this goes back to what Aaron was saying in that last talk, know your scope. Um, answer this question, know what this question, like the answer to this question at the beginning. And if you're a funder or someone, or, you know, or like a, a, some, an organization that's looking to find a developer, just tell them what your budget is. Like I know sometimes there's like this like, oh, well, you know, can you give us an estimate on how much it would take to make a game? That's never, or, you know, what you want to do if you have all that negotiation literature is to be believed. You want to peg the, you know, you want to set the, the bar to start with. And if you've set it somewhere, most people can figure out something to make for almost any amount of money. Um, but if you ask like, well, how much does it take to make a game? Like most game developers are gonna think like a lot, um, uh, <laughs> as much as possible. Um, and so the more you have an answer to this, um, the better off you'll be. So be realistic about what that is. Um, it will help you uh, do one thing which is really um, uh, important, which is constrain the problem, right? Like it, it'll focus you in on things. So constraints are really good. Like sometimes we like to think like, oh, my game's gonna do everything and it's gonna be everything to everybody. The more you can constrain your problem, the better off you'll be. So think about what your budget is before you get started. We think about that with any project we're doing. Even internal projects, we think um, a gigantic mechanic could come out and play. We sort of like set an internal budget. We're like, this is how much we're willing to spend on this thing. Um, and then we can begin to make decisions about materials, um, time spent on it, where we're going to do it, what the format's going to be. Um, next is uh, to really ask yourself, what do you want to accomplish with your game? Um, and so sometimes there's a there's a sort of a, a tendency to want to do a um, do a bit of everything, and I think it's much you're much better off if you pick one of these things, right? Like don't try and make your game a both a branding exercise and a business exercise and a, you know inspirational. Pick one of those things and do it really well, right? Because you have that limited amount of attention that you're going to get, and in five minutes, like it, you know, most games, like the, when we're thinking about a new game that we're going to put on the internet, we think we've got about like five minutes of attention to start with. If we don't hit them with most of it in that first five minutes, they're on to something else, unless it's really good. So, of those things, like which we can't hit all those notes. So, which of those notes you want to hit? Um, and again, the more you narrow in, I think the better off you'll be. So then, this is a uh, something I really uh, would stress. Think about what other formats, um, formats might also accomplish your goals. So games are better at certain things than others. So sometimes we think that games are gonna, gonna communicate lots of information. I wanna make some highly systematic game which is gonna teach people lots of things. Um, I always think of that, uh, the Bernard Suits quote, uh, that games are about putting unnecessary obstacles in people's way. It's all about making people jump over dumb hurdles, right? And if you're making people do that, then you're like, to do that, you're you know, not necessarily communicating things in the most efficient way. So if what you want to do is like, if your answer here was just teach or give a bunch of information, um, you might be better off just uh, putting out a pamphlet or a website or a poster. So like, don't get married to the idea of games too early. Um, think about who you're trying to engage with a game. Uh, so, and with that, be very specific. Think about who that user is. Know who that, like, know who that person is. Like, have a, a model of that person in your head. Um, and one of the things you're going to want to ask yourself as you're thinking about that is, is your audience the players for your game or is it someone else, right? So we did a project a couple of years ago, this uh, um, sim at a museum up in Boston, and the players are the kids, but they're not the real audience. This is the audience, it's teachers. The teachers are the people that bring the kids there. So they're the people that we actually have to talk to. And so the more you understand who your audience is, then the more you can, uh, the better off you're gonna um, be because you can go talk to them and ask them questions and figure out exactly what they want, right? And that's super important. You won't waste a lot of time um, coming up with ideas that no one wants. And along with that, you wanna figure out who are the champions for your game. Um, and so again, this is a part of the, going back to that idea of finding a niche audience. Um, you want to find who is the person that's going to help you find and engage players, right? Um, and so this is a, if you don't have a lot of marketing, you want to find people that have a built-in audience. So we've worked on lots of projects where um, the, the, you know, they're sort of like, let's do a big general audience game and we'll invite everyone to it and that'll be great and lots of people show up and inevitably no one comes because we weren't specific enough about who we were trying to reach. And we also never found um, someone to be the champion for us. So again, with the sim, um, reaching all the school kids in Boston to come to this museum to play this, uh, this role-playing game would have been very difficult. But finding teachers that would be champions for it, that want to bring their students there, that's much easier. We can know who they are. We can go find them. And then we can take advantage of their audience, which is the, where the kids that are in their classrooms. Um, 
And so again, find out what do they want out of the game. Find out what will like. If you're going to find those champions, you want to you know if you're making a game for game for change that's going to be teaching or inspiring or doing one of those, your audience, those champions, they they want something out of this game. They're looking for it to do something for them um, in the con. They're you know with their audience. So find out what that is and figure out how you can help them do it. Um, and then think about what, you know, again, if you're thinking about, if you're on a tight budget, what existing games could you use, right? So there's lots of uh, ways in which you can draw learning out of games that already exist. And if you think, oh, there's no game that teaches this, you're probably not thinking hard enough um, about it. Uh, so oftentimes, what the, the more valuable thing you could spend your time doing, rather than just making a new game, is to be thinking about, like, what are the right questions to draw something out of a game that's already out there, right? So if you want to make a game about um, statistics, poker is a great way to do that, like, um, or about math, that will that'll get a lot of that. You don't need to necessarily make a new math game to do that. There's lots of games that are already about math. Um, think about how you'll create a context to help your game succeed. So this is something that we run into a lot, um, and it's a, it's a little strange, but um, this, uh, what, I want you, what I want you to think about it is play appropriate in the context you're imagining. Right? So sometimes uh, you're thinking about a subject matter where play may not be appropriate. Um, sometimes you're putting play into a museum or a space and people walk in and they're like, what, you want me to, and you're like, would you like to play a game? And they're like, what? So we did a game for the MoMA a couple years ago um, where it was all about talking about the art. It was a pretty good game, I think. Um, but every time we would ask anyone who walked in the gallery if they wanted to play it, it was like you asked them to look at pornography. They're like, what? Um, I came to the MoMA to be very sophisticated. Um, and so what we found in that case was that maybe play wasn't quite the appropriate thing for that context. Um, and so you really want to think about that. And if you are going to still dive into that, um, uh, think about how you're going to shape the context to make the, the, the play work. So in this case, we spent a lot of time on the game. And what we should have figured out is how to frame the game for people, like uh, how would the, you know, we create a context where they could play, whether that was like tours or something else, um, or posters. Um, and then think about what format should your game take. Uh, what will give you the biggest bang for your buck? So, uh, you know, again, oftentimes we like sort of default to video games or lots of things with lots of technology, but I think it's often much more advantageous to think about um, paper games or car games, especially when you're thinking about starting out. Um, so look around, what's gonna give you the biggest bang for your buck to start with? So those are the, the questions we use every time we like for, um, are thinking about a new project, the, the kind of questions we ask ourselves. Every time we don't ask ourselves one of those things, we always fuck up. And later on, we're like, oh, we didn't think about the audience. We didn't like narrow it down. or We didn't find someone to help us reach out to people. And it's always painful. So starting there will always um, guide you um, in uh, a better direction. So these are my 10 rules for, uh, my 10 rules of thumb for development. I'm sure there's many more, but here's um, some of the ways that we think about this. Um, so you wanna find the right partner. So if you're a game developer, um, uh, if, or like if you, if you don't know how to make a game, then you wanna find the right developer. Not all developers are the same. Um, so you wanna find ones that are working in the format that you're, what, that you're interested in doing something in. Um, so if you, um, if you don't have a lot of money, don't go talk to video game companies. Go talk to board game or card game companies. Think about those things. Think about the sort of game you want to make. If we with those questions, then find a developer that does that, that specializes in that. Um, and if you don't know how to um, build community, if you're a game designer and you've got an idea for a game for change, then go find somebody that can help you build community. Um, that happens to us all the time. Sometimes we come up with great ideas for games and then we make it and we're like, where do we put this thing? Um, and we don't know. Um, and so then we have to start that process of outreach and it's really painful if you've already made something. Because you're like, we made this, do you want it? And they're like, no. Shit, I should have talked to you earlier. Um, so uh, find the right partner. That's, and that's why that, that moment of talk, starting to talk to other people is super important. Find the right people to work with. Um, bolster your skill sets. Um, if you, and no matter what you're doing, if you're an organization that's looking to put together a game, stay involved with it. Uh, don't just hand it off. You guys are the experts in the stuff you're making, so you need to stay involved. Um, build in a series of gates. So uh, oftentimes uh, it's very tempting to be like, okay, look, we've decided to make a game, let's uh, so tell us what the budget is for this and we'll, we'll scope it out and we'll do the whole thing. Um, and that's probably not a great idea. Um, what we like to, when we're doing it, um, a project, um, whether it be an internal project or a client facing project, we'll often build in a, a series of gates and say like, what we should do is some concept development. If it's if after the concepts, we don't have a good concept, we should stop right there. And then we should do a prototype. And if the prototype sucks, we should stop right there. Um, so don't think that you're gonna go all the way just because you have the idea. Um, so make sure that whenever you're building out a development plan, you're building in a series of gates that you're gonna check 
whether this thing is a good thing to do at a multiple points along the way. Um, and the first one is right after you prototype and do the, your initial iteration. Like, um, I, would, I would even say after the concept, but it's definitely after the prototyping. Um, we throw out projects all the time um, where we're like, we, we were working on something for Come Out and Play, we're like, this is a great idea, this is a, it's a dancing game, we're gonna move around, and we worked on it for a couple weeks, and we're like, this game sucks. <laughs> um, and we just threw it out, like we just, you know, that was in a, there's no reason to pursue that. And so, um, but that's because at a certain point, we always ask ourselves, is this worth doing? Um, and it's, it's, it can be a painful thing, but you don't want to throw good money after bad. Um, don't try to do everything. Figure out one thing, uh, find one vector, so the, and focus on the vector that's most important to you. Don't try and innovate on art and technology and game design. Figure out one of those and do it well, right? So if the art is the most important thing to you, just worry about the art. Make a game that's you know, relatively uh, standard, like the way that, that the comment about Candy Crush is right on. It's not a particularly mind-blowingly innovative game, but it looks amazing, you know? Um, so they can, you can focus on that and really build that out. If you want to make something that's really like, that's really innovative on game design, don't try and make a big 3D world around it. Just focus on one thing. Spend your time and your money on one vector. Um, pick, pick an aesthetic that matches your means. So uh, this is, uh, so come out and play every year we run. We, we, this is a big festival that uh, we do. It's a grassroots festival. I think we put it on each year for about $4,000. Um, uh, and but that means that we have to make everything out of cardboard with chalk signs, and we like tape up things, and it looks like totally, you know, uh, homegrown DIY. But we just own that aesthetic, right? So if you can't afford some other aesthetic, pick an aesthetic that you can, and um, and then just own it and wear it with pride. And I think people will, um, if you make something fun and engaging, they'll react. They'll go. They'll go with you on it. Um, collaborate with your audience. Um, that, uh, that builds this idea of ownership. So this is a project we were doing down in, um, in Red Hook with some students. Um, we were gonna make these, this was an example of like, you know, we'd come up with this idea that we're gonna make some games down in Red Hook, uh, these hopscotch-like games. Um, and then immediately we, we checked ourselves and we're like, oh wait, this is one of those like, the times when we're gonna make something that no one wants. Um, <laughs> so we ought to go find some kids and work with them. And so we did, we went to a PS15 and they helped us design them. And so they like, had ownership of these games and they helped us figure out what would be there. And even if we could have made the games more easily on our own, um, there's something really important about this idea of collaboration and sharing ownership. The think of, in some ways, you can think about um, designing games on a budget as uh, as a bit of performant um, design as a performative process. Like you work with people, and that's as much as like the a lot of the benefit comes right there. Um, develop a plan to expand your audience. Um, uh, think about how you're gonna uh, grow them, and then plan for iteration. You're gonna be wrong, um, and so you know, the, you're gonna have to iterate on your design, um, so just build that into your initial budget and plan. Um, and then think in series. Uh, so oftentimes we kind of think like, I'm gonna make this game that's gonna solve this whole problem, and I think it's more often, uh, especially if you're, if you're operating on tight budgets, to think about how you're gonna do this better a second time. Um, so build small experiments that you can then elaborate on. So these games we put down in Red Hook, we um, put these chalk games down, we found a com community partner with a library and PS15, we made the games and we, we put them all down in front of the library and no one played with them, we're like, oh boy. Um, that, was a, that was a bust, and so, but we had a plan for that we were gonna put them down multiple times, and every time we did it, we learned something more, so we would make them longer and simpler, and by the end, like, they were beginning to engage people, but it's only because we thought about it operating in a sort of series. And now we've got like a sort of format that we could reuse multiple times in, in different places. Um, so, uh, that's, uh, those are my sort of like uh, real fast rules for development. Um, now, I would love to make this slightly more interactive than me just yammering at you guys. So I would love to, um, for us all to kind of do, go through one of these sets of questions around a project that one of you guys has um, and we could do together. So is there someone that's working on a project right now they'd be willing to share with us and we could start to ask these questions about it? Okay, all right, what, so what's, uh, all right, so tell us, uh, stand up and tell us your name and what your project, what you're working on right now. Okay. Uh, and we did a bunch of play testing so far. Um, we are at this stage that we want to do more play testing, but we also want to uh, put it into classrooms to see how it works. So, um, 
so perfect. So you started off, you said your budget was initially was zero. Like, and so you were like, you went with board game, not video game, right? So you kind of answered some of these initial questions. Can I ask you a question? What did you want to accomplish? Why were you making this game about, so, like, what was the idea behind it? What was the, what were you trying to get at? Okay, cool. Um, and so, you, so your, your main goal was to teach and like provoke something. Do you have a sense of how long you were gonna, like the, the engagement was gonna last? How long someone was gonna play this game? Okay, all right. Um, so that's great. I mean, you've kind of narrowed in that. You've figured out like a format that might accomplish your goals. Um, uh, and you feel like right now that in what you've done, like this sort of, you said you were doing some evidence-based research on it. Do you feel like you're getting, like the game is accomplishing your goals so far? Yeah. Okay. So Um, and uh, and you and was in this right now. You said you wound up with like working with students, like in, in classrooms. Is that what who you intended to be for? Like, is that who you view as your primary audience? Uh, we are a little flexible with the time that age group. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, we Okay. So someone raised their hand over there and said, "Yeah, you, they would like they have a classroom." Okay. So do, in this case, you do you, are you a teacher or are you yeah. okay? Um, and so in this case, like, is this a, a case where the students are the audience for it, or you're the audience for it? Like, why would you you want to use a game like this, like in your classroom? Um, it would be for the students. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what do you want out of the of, out of a game? Yeah, yeah. Because you're the one who's going to make the students do it, right? You're going to bring it to them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, and so you said there was a constraint right right now. There's a um, uh, so you know this is a case where you're like finding the champion for your game, right? Like you're going to help get it in front of people, and so there's a question of like you want to teach about current events. Um, you said it's an hour long. Is that too long? Yes. That's it. how long should it be? 46 minutes. <laughs> and do you need time beforehand or after? My experience in that school, it should be 35 minutes because you need that 10 minutes kind of like a. Right. I, I, I didn't hear it in this school, so I know. Right. Okay. Yeah, and so that's all. So, right. So, it's got to get, you got to get down to 35 minutes so that she can use it in the classroom, um, like before, like have them do something before and after. So, it's like find that um, and test it. Are there, um, in this case, are you using other existing games right now to do stuff like that? So, what do you use now? Um, and when, with this, because you want to teach a specific thing, why did you want to make a, that game? Why not just, I mean, like, a, why not make use a, a game that already existed?
Okay. And have other people, like, I mean, because there's a lot of brain power in this room. Have other people seen games that are sort of doing stuff like that? Okay. Um, have other people seen stuff that's doing games that are doing things like that right now? You kind of maybe? What? Yeah. What, what, what sort of? I'm saying some visual novels are going in that direction. Uh, some of them uh, on different kind of uh, like ones. Actually, I'm working on something similar as well. Uh, so um, visual novels like uh, kind of Christine Love's earlier works uh, talk a little bit about like um, it's more on a gender basis, like uh, gender studies and inequality and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, Chicago, the game. Uh, mm -hmm. However, they don't work in such a small, like they are video games, first of all. Mm. And second of all, uh, they um, uh, are uh, kind of, uh, uh, they take a much longer time to play. They might take around uh, seven hours, which is much more of a, like, if you showcase it in a class, it will be much more of a, uh, you can only play it for 30 minutes and maybe kids will be interested enough to take it to uh, a home. And of course, it might be uh, for an older age group as well, like teens and up. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, so we you know we know a little bit more about like what you what sort of like a project you're working on. Um, have you and then uh, finding like, the right partners, helping you that succeed, like figuring out like what the right format is, um, how long it could be. Do you need curriculum around it, or is that stuff that you want to build? Like if you were thinking about it. So you want that sort of built into it, uh, okay, right. So, um, okay, so these are these are all like sort of the, this is the conversation I think is, is super valuable. Um, and uh, and so you guys were saying like, would you, in, the, in a case like this, is a video, would you prefer it be a video game or a board game, something like a, an analog game? Like what's easier would, to use in the? Like, I would like to be able to choose between the two. It mm. depends on the class and it depends on the kids. Some mm. kids can handle having electronic in front of them, some kids Okay. Um, uh, okay. So, so this is that that this is the process I was uh, I was uh, envisioning, which is great. So, how, Emily, how much time do we have left? We, oh, I'm gonna go with ten minutes. Um, then. Uh, <laughs> so, what I would love for you guys to do, so you guys all got a chance to start talking to each other earlier. I would love for you guys to now, um, you know, reconnect with the people that you're around, and I want one of you to. Uh, Play the person um, that is the, sort of like the client. Like these are the, the projects you're working on. Um, explain what it is, and then I want the other person to ask them questions about it. Like really try and pr like probe through those things and force people to do it. Because sometimes it's hard to answer that question. You're kind of like immediately default to like I want everyone to play my game. And if you're asking the questions, make sure that they don't answer that. Get them to focus. Okay. So take what's going to take about like uh, five or six minutes and do that as a, you know with the people around you. Okay. Okay. So. Real quickly, uh, before we have to wrap up, um, do people have a, like, I mean, so you guys all got a chance to talk about this with the folks next to you. Does anybody want to, like, share other stuff? Like, because um, this is also a good ch chance to, like, stand up, talk about the thing you're working on, and there may, you may find other people that are sort of thinking along those lines, the same lines as you are. So does anybody just want to share what they're, what they're thinking about, um, what they, some of the questions they just went through? Any? Share your work. Okay. Yeah, so awesome. I
Cool. And I'm, I'm focusing on extra health, specifically for chronic conditions and serious health topics. So we focus on two parts, educating people about these health conditions, how to manage it. And secondly, then adapting those behaviors in their day-to-day life, because that's the way we manage chronic health conditions. So um, currently in pediatric asthma and allergies, and potentially in cystic fibrosis. And so I'll ask a question about all three of those. So do you guys, uh, have you guys thought about who do you think your, those, the partners you need are? Like who do you, in each case, which one, you, what, like who do you think you need to help you do that? Or do you already have a sense of, have, have you already formed those partnerships? So, who, so, so the, in that way, like you, so it sounds like you have a sense of like who can help you make it. Who's the audience for it? Like who do, who are the who are the people you have to reach to get it in front of players? Because it sounds like an interesting game, but it also sounds like a hard lift in some ways because it's sort of it's, it's doing many things. So, who do you have to get in front of to find that audience? Do you think? Mm-hmm. Okay. So where do you find those people? <laughs> right. No, no. And so I, I don't mean to put, that's not to put you on the spot, that, but that's like, that's the, the, you know, every time with all these things, just keep going down that path, right? Like, it's like, oh, these people, I want those people. I want the serious, the people who like serious films, like document, well, people like documentaries. Where are they? Are they at film festivals? Are they here? Can I go talk to them there? Are they on Netflix? Are they like, um, at, you know, is it film festivals? Or where is like, you know, where do you organize those things? Are they people in schools? So, um, and that, like, you will never go wrong if you keep asking yourself, like, getting more specific about the audience. And any, think, go ahead. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I have to ask myself, actually, is to um, ask a few more journalists, um, mm. like, how many people read your stuff? Right. Um, does it actually convert into actual And also thinking about like, oh. Okay, cool. All right, well, thank you guys very much. Um, Hopefully, uh, some of this was useful. Uh, I appreciate you guys very much.